My old house in Erlanger had white baseboards on the, you know, along the bottom of the wall. And I remember one time my mom, I was, I don't know, I guess I was probably in my early 30s, late 20s when this happened. She came to visit and she's like, Stephanie, these are white baseboards and they're dusty and dirty. You need to clean them. And I was like, I am an adult. You come to my house and you're going to tell me that I got to clean my house better? And I was a little like, ah. And then I realized she's still my mom and she's right. And when I really looked at it, I was like, oh, she right. Like, they are dirty, you know? And I was a little put out at first, but I realized she was trying to help me. And then I got to thinking about all my friends who had been to my house and none of my friends said, you know, you probably should clean those baseboards. It's kind of like when you've gone all day and you get home and you notice there's like something in your teeth and you know you ate like five hours. I say it and Paula goes, <laughs> you know you ate like five hours ago and you're like, all my friends talked to me for hours and nobody told me there's something in my teeth? Like, what the heck? It's, it's, sometimes it's embarrassing to have someone say you got something in your teeth, you got dust on your baseboards, but I'd so much rather someone say you've got some spinach in your teeth than let me go all day talking to all kinds of people and not have any idea. You know, that's what good friends tell you when you got something in your teeth, just like my mom told me when there's dust on my baseboard. But people don't like to tell people. Some people don't like to tell people. Some people love to tell people. And we're going to talk about a little bit of both sides of that. Um, because good friends challenge each other. Good friends say, hey, you got something in your teeth. Good friends say, I don't know that you handled that situation in the best way. You know what I mean? A good friend calls you out when, you're, when you maybe aren't doing something the right way. I'm going to share a little story that I, I'm going to change the names of the people because I misbehaved. <laughs> I had a friend, we'll call her June, um, and she had made me mad. And I was like, Ugh. and I didn't want to have a conversation with her, so I wrote this big, long email, and I talked about all the things she did to make me mad. And I have another friend, we'll call her Sally, and um, I shared the email with Sally. I was like, is this right? Do you, think this is, do you think I should send this? Well, Sally happened to also be mad at June at the time, so Sally's like, yeah, she should hear that. But before I sent the email... I sent it to my mentor, who's actually my pastoral mentor, and I said, what do you think about this? And she read it, and she said, why do you think an email is the best way to solve this problem? She didn't even address what was in the email. She was coming outside of it, like, why do you think an email? She's like, if you send this email, she's probably going to be blindsided. She's probably not going to take it well. And then what's going to happen to your friendship? What are you hoping to accomplish with this email? And I was, I realize now, later, that the email was a very selfish way of me telling her all the things without having to deal with her telling me what I had done wrong. Or her, like, it was a very one-sided, selfish way to deal with the problem. And ironically, Sally was also frustrated, and Sally sent an email, and Sally and June are no longer friends. So that tells me that I'm glad I didn't send the email because I think it would have gone really badly for our friendship. My mentor, Diana, is amazing. She does a great job at listening and then she acknowledges my feelings. She's like, oh, it sounds to me like you feel this or I, I recognize that you feel this. I would feel that way too. She, you know, she acknowledges and she justifies my feelings. And then she'll say, what do you think about this? And she asks me these probing questions and tries to get me to get to a better solution. And I love that. And D Diana is a, she's a pastor of Florence. And so, of course, she's following the Jesus model. Jesus did this with his guys all the time. Jesus challenged his guys. Now, to be fair, Jesus was a mentor more than just a friend, right? But Jesus challenged his guys and sometimes... He challenged them in a good way. Why, do you, why did you do that? What do you think about that? Could there have been a better way? And sometimes Jesus didn't do it so nicely. <laughs> because Jesus is like, you got to stop it. You're being a jerk. You know? So here's one example um, to give you a little backstory. So Jesus 
Jesus and his dudes were together anywhere from one to three years. There's some conflicting evidence on that. And towards the end of his ministry, he had trained them up. He had given them the power to go out. He sent them out two by two, and they were wildly successful out there. While they were out there, they were saving people. They were healing people. They were casting demons out. They were doing all these amazing things. And so they were probably feeling, feeling pretty like, I, I, gotta go, I gotta figure it out. I, look how powerful we are. And they loved Jesus. And so they were heading to this town. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem the final time. Here, I'll read you the story. Um, so when the time had approached for him to be taken up to heaven, he was determined to go to Jerusalem to fulfill his purpose. He sent messengers ahead of him, and they went into the Samaritan village to make arrangements for him. But the people would not welcome him because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and destroy them? But he turned and rebuked them. He said, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they journeyed on to another village. So a little backstory: the Samaritans did not like the Jews. So when these Samaritan people hear that these Jewish guys want to stay because they're heading to Passover, they're like, oh, we don't want those guys. And so James and John, the sons of thunder, they wanted to like call down a Sodom and Gomorrah here. So this is referencing an Old Testament story, Hebrew Bible story. There were these two towns, Sodom and Gomorrah, that were next to each other, kind of like Lolo and Bromley. And there, the people there were just not good people. They were sinning all over the place and doing a lot of really bad stuff, very violent stuff. And so God said, uh, long story short, God was going to destroy him. And um, Abraham was like, wait, 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 what if there's one or two good people? And so finally he says, all right, there's like 10 good people in this whole town. I won't destroy them. He couldn't find any good people except for one family. That family got out. God rained down fire and sulfur and destroyed the whole thing. So whenever you hear Sodom and Gomorrah, it's like God's wrath on these bad people. So James and John, called the sons of thunder, so I assume these guys were spitfires. They're like, oh, you're dissing our Jesus? You're going to put him down? Oh, you are not. Uh-uh, you aren't going to diss my Jesus. We'll call down fire. We'll call Sodom and Gomorrah on you, you. And Jesus is like, hold up. Just because they didn't welcome me doesn't mean we destroy them. He's, and he says to me, you, he says to them, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. He's saying to them, who is influencing this thought process? Is it God influencing this thought process or is it Satan influencing this thought process? Who are you listening to right now? And when my mentor read my email, basically her question was, what, do you, what kind of spirit are you listening to? Who are you being influenced by right now? You see, we, we sometimes need to be called out. James and John, they were super effective at what they did. They were really great. I mean, they were one of the first ones that Jesus called. They were like, when he, <coughs> when it was just him and a couple other guys, it was always James and John. They were, there were three of them. They're like his besties. And they were two of his besties. And yet they still got it wrong. And this is at the end of his ministry. They're still getting it wrong at the end of the ministry. And Jesus is like, I got to correct you guys. Good friends call you out when you misbehave. And I like this version. I had a hard time finding the version. Not all of them say it this way. Some of them just say Jesus rebuked them and they moved on. But I wanted this one because it says, <clears throat> you don't know what kind of spirit you are. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So when you see a friend who is out for destruction, and it's, when you know that they are believers, it's our job to say, hey, what kind of spirit are you listening to right now? What's influencing this right now? What do you think will be the outcome? My mentor often says, like, she'll ask me a question. She'll listen, and then she'll ask me a question, and she'll say, what do you think you should do? And then she'll be like, okay, and if you do that, then what? She does a really good job of leading me to come to my own conclusions. Good friends, listen to the whole story. My friend Jill, 
She gets really mad when she's like, they didn't even listen to the whole story, and they just start giving me advice. And she's like, did they not think I thought about that? I hadn't even told them all the things I thought about. I haven't even told them all the things, all the ways, all the things that are going on, and they just immediately jump in and start giving me advice. I didn't even ask for their advice. And we do this a lot. We Christians especially have a bad reputation of being judgmental. And the reason people think we're judgmental is because we listen just a little snippet of it, and then we judge and then we give advice that hasn't been asked for. Our job as Christians is not to go around giving everybody else advice. To your good friends, yes. To some random person on Facebook who you met twice and made them your Facebook friend, no. To your coworker who's not like your truly good friend, no. To your neighbor who you say hi to when you walk by and that's the extent of your friendship, no. Unless someone asks you for advice, or they're your good friend, you don't give advice. That When we give advice that's not been asked for, that is interpreted as judgmental. Because I'm saying, I've listened to you, and Jill says this, she says it, and I'm like, that's not what I meant. And then I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh, it kind of is. She's like, you just think you're smarter than me. You think you can come up with a solution that I couldn't come up with. And I'm like, no, I, oh, I kind of did. <laughs> She's right. See, I've given Jill permission to speak into my life, to give me advice, to call me out when my baseboards are dirty, I got something stuck in my teeth, or I'm misbehaving. We should all have a friend, at least one, who we can go to and, they, and we've given them permission to give us advice. Because if you don't do that, then there's no one to tell you your baseboards are dirty or there's spinach in your teeth. Or you're about to send a fire in, I was about to send down fire and brimstone on my friend June. We're not supposed to, we've got to have someone who challenges us. There's this verse, um, Proverbs, iron sharpens iron, and so one person sharpens another. You've got to have someone sharpening you. Which means you've got to give someone permission to sharpen you. And you've got to be in a strong relationship with someone so that you get to know them well enough, you listen to the whole story, you ask the probing questions, you ask the challenging questions, and if they choose to not do it, that's fine. That's on them. If they decide that that's the, the way they're going to do it, okay, cool. And you can still be friends with them. Okay, we've got, to, we've got to learn to give advice just to our close friends, but in a <laughs> loving way. My mentor did it in a loving way. She wasn't like, oh, that's a terrible idea, Stephanie. I don't know what you're thinking. She asked really great questions. <laughs> what do you think the outcome will be when you send this email? Why do you want to send this email? I took a, I just finished uh, my last session. It was a pastoral care class, which is like how to counsel people. And what the, my biggest takeaway from that is it's never my job to fix somebody. It's God's job to fix somebody. It is my job to lead them to God. It is my job to listen, to encourage, to pray for them. And, to, and I, can ask, I can ask them questions to get them thinking of it. I can do things to lead them to God. I can be like, well, I feel like God would say something like this. Or what do you think God would think about that? Or where, where do you see God in this situation? What do you think the outcome would be if you did that? But it is not my job to come in and take over your life. It is not my job to come in and tell you how to live your life. It is my job to be your friend, to listen, to encourage, and to sharpen at times with love, with love. You know, Jesus would rebuke his guys, but then he would love them right after that. Like one time he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And then right after that, he's like, who do you think Jesus... Uh, he gave him a chance to say, who am I? And he says, you're the Messiah. I'm like, all right, I love you. I'm going to build my church on you. So Jesus would rebuke them at times, but always with love, always out of love, not a, I'm going to put you in your place. That's what we're supposed to be, a good friend, listens, encourages, challenges, and might say, maybe that's not a good idea, but we always do it in love and only in close relationships. So my challenge, I have two challenges for you this week. Let me put my glasses on. Three, to be better listeners, there's a reason we have two ears and one mouth. 
We tend to speak too soon and not listen. Stop giving uninvited, un like uninvited advice. Only give advice to people who ask for it or they're your super close friend. And to give your, you've got to have one or two friends that you give permission to sharpen you. So think to yourself, who are my one or two people who I'm going to give permission to challenge me? And all of that's children said.